In this video we'll look at thought guidelines to find German assault guns or Sturmgeschütze, generally called Stucks. Now the source for this is the April 1944 issue of the Bulletin of the Panzerwaffe, in which an article was printed that used as a source the guideline printed in the Soviet artillery journal issue from May June 1943. I asked Peter from Tank Archives is he, if he have seen the original, yet sadly he hasn't. So we have to stick to the German article. First a bit of context, Alaric Searle notes, the significance of assault guns could be seen in an order of the Red Army Marshal of Artillery, Voronov, of 2nd July 1943, which considered that the destruction of German assault guns was of the highest importance. Officers and troops had to be instructed to recognize the difference between tanks and assault guns. Artillery had to direct its fire against the assault guns first, and according to an order of 24 of June 1943, any soldier who destroyed an assault gun was to receive a military decoration. So let us look at the Soviet guidelines. It starts off with a basic description on the capabilities of the assault gun and how to combat them. The peculiar nature of assault guns and their great mobility on the battlefield make it expedient to employ special batteries and battalions firing from concealed positions to combat assault guns. These batteries and battalions are to have special observers who will report the appearance of assault guns in a timely manner or open fire on them immediately. Now it is important to keep in mind that the Soviets used a lot of multi-purpose artillery pieces, most notably the 76mm CIS-3 gun, which is often portrayed as an anti-tank gun, yet that is a rather imprecise description according to Zaloga. This gun, the CIS-3 M for 1942 76mm is often mistakenly identified as an anti-tank gun, when in fact the anti-tank gun member of this artillery family was the 57mm CIS-2 gun. The 76 CIS-3 was simply the latest in a long line of Russian slash Soviet divisional guns, tracing its ancestry back to the 3 inch 76 model 1902 gun. Now what does divisional gun mean here? This means it was a regular artillery piece that was extremely common since it was standard equipment for regular divisions. Similar to the 105mm like the Feldhobitz 18 of the Germans, the M2A1 105mm howitzer of the Americans or the 25 pounder of the British in World War II. Yet these guns were used mainly in indirect fire, whereas the CIS-3 also was also used a lot in direct fire. As such, artillery in these articles refers both to direct and indirect fire. The document continues by noting that the best results against Sturmgeschütze are achieved by constructing a system of outposts, meaning that the outposts are behind natural or artificial defenses and are organized in depth. It then outlines how the Soviets perceived the German tactics against such a position. In the case of positions constructed in time by our troops and in the presence of minefields in front of the main defensive area, the German assault guns attack in a deep echelon, one platoon behind the other. In doing so, the second and third echelons cover by their fire the first echelon and the engineers who create the passages through the minefields. The instructions on how to deal with such a German attack are as follows. In this case, the fire of our artillery firing from concealed positions is to be directed at all three echelons of assault guns. The heaviest fire is to be directed against the assault guns of the second and third echelons. The engineers are to be engaged by mortars at closer range by machine gun fire. This will enable our anti-tank guns in favorable cases to engage the assault guns of the first echelon in direct fire. It is further noted that a common error of the anti-tank gun crews has to be avoided, namely opening fire above the range of 1.5 km, that is about 0.9 miles. Since such a fire is usually not effective, additionally it gives away the position of the anti-tank guns, which is generally rather unhealthy for the gun crews. The next part is about the combination of different artillery shells for the most effective fire. When fighting assault guns, the best results are obtained by timely prepared fire, alternating with explosive and time fuse rounds. This fire not only puts the guns out of action, but also destroys the crews as well as the engineers of accompanying infantry. When the assault guns approach within 1 to 1.5 km of our main line of resistance, they are destroyed by direct anti-tank gun fire regardless of the depth of their formation. I am not entirely sure why the combination of high explosive and time delay shells is used. I know it is a rather typical or a classic combination, 
Generally, time-delayed shells are often used to engage in duck-in troops, fortifications and as ricochets for better fragmentation, as outlined in my German artillery tactics video. So an impact fuse without delay will explode on impact, which usually means that the shell will penetrate the ground to a certain degree. As a result, some of the shell fragments will be swallowed by the ground. And some sensitive fuse might be more advisable. In this case, the majority of the fragmentation will be delivered outwards. Whereas with an impact fuse with delay, the resulting explosion will be caught mostly in the surrounding terrain. So at first glance, it seems that against targets in the open, the sensitive impact fuse might be the best. Yet this is only one part of the picture. Because with a proper angle and conditions of the ground, we might actually get the best effect against targets in the open with the delayed fuse. Now how is this possible? Well, we might achieve an abralla, a ricochet. In this case, the projectile will bounce off the ground and explode literally in mid-air, which can result in the most devastating fragmentation effect against uncovered targets in the open. Now another situation when a delayed fuse might be very practical is against dug-in targets. Yet in this case we are not dealing with dug-in troops, but troops that are attacking. As such I suspect the use of time-delayed shells has several reasons. First, even attacking troops seek cover, so this helps flushing out the supporting troops. Second, time-delayed shells also create deeper craters in the soil, which likely could lead to Stucks getting stuck or also detract, being detracked. Third, ricochet firing allows covering a large area with fragments. This would be particularly dangerous to the supporting infantry. Fourth, since Stucks and other armored fighting vehicles are generally weakly armored at the top, a delayed shell might be theoretically able to penetrate the top armor and go off inside the Stuck which could have a greater effect than a high explosive shell going on on the top. Although when I asked Roman Töppel about this, he noted that he did not come across such an incident in a report so far. By the way, if you're interested in German documents, Chris from Military Aviation History and I currently have an Indiegogo campaign running for the translation of key documents about the famous German dive bomber the Junkers 87 Stucker. If you want to learn more, check out this video or click in the link in the pinned comment. Get back to the document. The next part is about defending if only weak defenses are available. When attacking our weakly fortified positions, the enemy employs the assault guns massed in front of the infantry. In this case, it is expedient to disperse them even before the effective range of the direct fire anti-tank guns and to engage them in parts by combined barrage from concealed positions. Sadly, the document does not indicate how exactly a Salkan should be broken up. Let us move on. If the direction of attack of these Salkans is known in advance, the mobile anti-tank reserve is to be called in to fight them and must make itself ready to fire even before it is reached by enemy Salkans. For this purpose, positions for the anti-tank reserve are to be built in a timely manner. Of course, you might wonder what a mobile anti-tank reserve is. Well, according to the Soviet General Staff Study of Kursk, these go back at least to March 1943, so a few months before the original Soviet article was published. In this March 1943 instructions, the Central Front Artillery Commander had already underscored the necessity for creating mobile anti-tank reserves. While implementing those instructions, each rifle division designated a mobile anti-tank reserve with a strength of no fewer than one artillery battalion and up to two companies of anti-tank rifles. Note that an anti-tank rifle company of a tank destroyer brigade in 1942-1943 had 24 anti-tank rifles according to Sir Logan Ness, but these numbers changed. For instance, one time 27 anti-tank rifles are noted. For the battalion we have the same situation. One example is a tank destroyer artillery battalion with three batteries of 76 gun, each with four guns, so a total of 12 guns for June 1942. The next part deals with how a breakthrough should be countered. In the event of a breakthrough, the assault guns are to be brought under the combined fire not only of artillery and anti-tank rifles, but also infantry weapons. The combined fire of machine guns and rifles on the crews of assault guns is effective at a distance of 400 yards and may cause the crews to leave the assault guns. Now it is not clear if the crews would leave the vehicle due to the threat, so abandoning the vehicle or to engage in combat themselves, because according to the German documents of the Sturmgeschützschule, it was actually job of the loader to engage in close combat when necessary. 
The loader must always be ready to fight anti-tank infantry with hand grenades and submachine gun. Close combat weapons should therefore always be kept at hand. For more information on this subject, check out my Stuck School video. The next part is particularly interesting because it deals with engaging the Sturmgeschütze indirectly via their supply units. In protracted engagements, assault guns are often forced to replenish their ammunition supply. The ammunition is brought close to the battle area by armored vehicles. Attention must be paid to this fact and the ammunition carrying armored vehicles must be detected and destroyed. In this way, the use of assault guns can be made more difficult or even not possible at all. After the German translation of the Soviet guidelines, there is a statement by the General Inspector of the Panzerwaffe, namely Heinz Guderian. He notes, It is clear from the article that the Russian sees the assault gun as a particular dangerous weapon. He then derives several paragraphs for the crews of the Sturmgeschütze, the first being that surprise is a key requirement for success, noting that the enemy should only be aware of the Stuks when they are already attacking, adding, even with inferior forces, resounding successes can be achieved. The second major paragraph is about scouting and preparation, which he notes is the first duty of the leaders. He notes, it saves blood and breakdowns and builds confidence in the leader and the weapon. He notes that four points are of special importance, namely the enemy, friendly troops, terrain and cooperation. Under each point several questions are listed. This is rather similar to Sun Tzu's assessment that one has to know oneself and the enemy. For instance, one question about friendly troops is if they already had seen combat with Sturmgeschütze. The third major paragraph is about mutual cooperation of the assault guns. He explicitly notes, the armor protection does not make invulnerable. Therefore, exploit terrain, observe, do not stand target in case of direct fire. Watch out for enemy close combat troops. Short reminder, if you want to know more about the Indigo campaign, check out this video for more information. Anyway, I hope you learned something new. Thanks to Roman Töppel for helping out with some questions and thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. If you like what you see, consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. Big thank you to all of you who already did this or do this here. As always, source the list in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.